Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Hello, welcome everyone. Welcome to our 69th UTM Engineering Distinguished Lecture Series. This particular session of DLS is jointly organized with Malaysia Japan International Institute of Technology, MJIIT. And our distinguished speaker today is Professor Maki Sujimura from the land of the rising sun. To introduce our speaker today, I invite Professor Ali Slaman, Dean of MJIIT, to read Professor Maki Sujimura's biography. Over to you, Prof. Ali. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Prof. Dato Rafiq, for allowing me to introduce uh, Professor Dr. Maki Sujimura. He's a prominent professor in the areas of uh, hydrology and water resources from uh, Scopa University. How are you, Professor Sujimura? Hi. hi. Yeah, Hi, nice, 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 nice to see you. Yeah, good to see you again. Yeah, yeah. I hope that the the, the situation of COVID nineteen in Japan is getting better now. Uh, I think so. So yeah. yeah, I would like to meet meet Kuala Lumpur again soon. <laughs> All right, that's good. So with with us here, Professor Zujimura is going to share with us a topic related to the sustainable groundwater governance based on understanding of regional water cycle system. So Professor Sujimura is a very well-known professor from the uh, Faculty of uh, Life Science and Environmental Sciences, the University of Scuba, and uh, he's the co-chair of UNESCO chair program on sustainable groundwater management in Mongolia. It's quite far away from here, actually. Yeah, <laughs> and of course, uh, he's the vice president of International Commission on a uh, tracer uh, ICT, International Association of Hydrological Sciences, and many others, yeah? And uh, of course, uh, presently, he's the uh, uh, prominent professor and uh, uh, chair of Japanese National Committee of, for the International Association of Hydrological Sciences. And uh, more importantly, in Malaysia, is we are going to have this uh, Scuba University branch campus. And... Uh, <laughs> Prof. Sujimura is a prominent professor that, uh, you know, inspiring of this initiative. And uh, he's the director of the branch campus preparation office at Scuba University's uh, branch uh, in Malaysia in the future, hopefully. Yeah. So I think uh, without further ado, Prof. Sujimura, now I would like to uh, give the floor to you to share about the topics that you're going to uh, share with our audience today on uh, sustainable groundwater governance based on understanding original water uh, cycle system. So with that, the floor is yours. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much for your introductions. So I would like to share my laptop um, with you. Okay, so... You can you can look at that yes we can see the powerpoint presentation prof thank you okay okay thank you so today i would like to talk on the sustainable groundwater governance based on understanding of regional water cycle system so i would like to raise one question for you how much water do we use so one data of course it depending on the situation conditions but in average malaysian people use 210 liter per day per person based on water supply basis and singapore 151 united states 220 and how about japan 224 so anyway it depends on the situation in each countries but we use the water approximately 200 liter per day per person so without water we cannot live as you may know well but Water sometimes caused me or caused us very uh, serious disasters like a flood and desertifications in some areas like a flood. We have very frequently flood uh, disasters and landslide as well. And also we have sometimes suffered from uh, deforestation, urbanization as radionuclide accident with water. So water has advantage and disadvantage both. So we needed to know water very well. How much water is available on the Earth? So water on the Earth, 97% from the oceans, as you may know, and fresh waters, just 2.6%. But 
more than 73% of fresh water is coming from ice and snow, and rest 25% is coming from the ground waters. So most available fresh water is coming from the ground waters. Okay. And now, given a total water on the earth, just 100 liters, then fresh water is supposed to be three liters and available water, in other words, easily drinkable water is just half spoon. So basically water is very vulnerable. So we needed to understand that. And in SDGs, 17 Sustainable Development Goals, we needed to go toward to 2030s for achieving the 17 uh, main goals. Among them, one of the most important goal is SDG 6, clean water and sanitation. And SDG, SDG 6 clearly mentioned that fresh water in sufficient quantity and quality is essential for all aspects of life and sustainable development. The human rights to water and sanitation are widely recognized by member states. And water resources are embedded in all forms of development in sustaining economic growth. So we need to understand the water issues linked with every issues mentioned in SDG 17th goals. For example, in synthesis report of SDG 6 in 2018, Ulenbrook reported that proportion of population using at least basic drinking water services in 2015 like this. So most of the areas, more than 90% completed, except for the mid area of Africa. However, Proportion of population using safely managed drinking water services in 2015, many of the areas in no data. So even for those water issues, we needed to continue to achieve the SDG 6 goals with not only at least water, but also safely managed drinking water is available. That is final destination for SDG 6. And one more point is Ullenbrook 2008 synthesis report of SDG, SDG 6 mentioned that good water governance is essential. For example, for rural water supply with policy and procedure, in other words, the top down by government action completed 84%. However, with high participation at every stakeholder is just reached at 20%. Rural sanitation as well, more than 80 top down, but stakeholders participation just 20%. Urban water supply, just 12% achieved for the stakeholder participation. So groundwater governance is essentially important to achieve SDG 6 or accessibility for waters for everybody. What is groundwater governance? Basically, groundwater governance comprises the promotion of responsible action to ensure the conservation and sustainable use for groundwater resource and long-term management of aquifer systems. What's the difference between governance and management? When we say water management or groundwater management, that is more, more, more focusing on the top-down actions. Government decides something, policy, then everybody leaves there. However, for we say, when we say groundwater governance, that is more bottom-up passions, bottom-up aspects. Therefore, every stakeholder should participate, join the scheme of the governance. So there are a lot of framework uh, for the groundwater governance achievement, institutional framework, legal and regulatory framework, regulatory framework, accurate knowledge of groundwater flow system. It's very important. And also political action, participation of multiple stakeholders. 
So one of the most important points is that uh, accurate knowledge of groundwater flow system and participation of multiple stakeholders. That is very specific uh, characterization of groundwater governance. Differ from being differ from groundwater management or water management. So one is uh, this is a typical uh, groundwater issues or water uh, water transactions or strict issues uh, for transboundary aquifers issues. What is transboundary aquifers issues? Actually, the borders drawn against the natural conditions. Okay, sometimes surface water river across the borders. However, this border on the ground surface extend to the underground. So sometimes, while very frequently, like uh, African continents, the groundwater flows across the borders. In this case, the, if some contamination occurred, then the groundwater would transfer that contaminants with water flows across the borders, then invisible. So some years later, such kind of contaminants would appear in the river waters. So this is very complicated issues, water conflict. So the transboundary water issues are one of the most typical and serious water conflict issues all over the world. So transboundary water issues includes multiple scopes to be solved. For example, scientific hydrogeological scope, it is definitely most important point, but we needed to have legal aspect, legal viewpoints, and socioeconomic viewpoints, institutional viewpoints, and environmental viewpoints. Those multiple scopes and viewpoints should be necessary to solve the issue transboundary water conflict. But anyway, water cycles. So above figure shows natural water cycle system and below figure shows anthropogenic activities affect on the water cycles. The ocean evaporate and atmospheric water vapor transfer in the atmosphere and some areas we have much precipitation including rainfall, snow and hail and, and so on. And some water on the ground surface evaporate and some waters run off and infiltrate into the ground and with groundwater flow that discharge to the stream or ocean again. This is natural water cycle system. And when we live, humankind live, we need to cultivate on the ground. Such cultivation and sometimes agriculture needs fertilizer. That fertilizer necessary, however, in some cases, cause contamination issues. Some contaminants would be transferred with the waters, groundwater especially. On the coastal area, like uh, Kuala Lumpur, then the big cities locates at the coastal uh, due to a uh, very good accessibility on ship, uh, transfer, trans transportations, and they need much of the groundwater. Groundwater drawdown may cause seawater intrusion into the fresh waters. So this kind of Anthropogenic activities may affect on the groundwater, not only for the groundwater, water cycle itself. And such kind of water cycle may affect on the anthropogenic activities. So we need to consider both aspects always. The surface water is very easy for us to look at directly. However, we cannot look at groundwater directly, but we could access the groundwater via wells. This is coming from the Tunisia and Japan, and also Japan. So the well is only a window for groundwater for us to access. This is the groundwater and surface water cycle system schematic diagram. Okay. The ground surface here and groundwater level there. Okay. Basically, even groundwater cycles or move or flows. And river water and spring water, those are surface water, is a part of the groundwaters. 
In other words, river water table is a part of the groundwater table. Therefore, we could have always river flows, even during the rainless period. In the rainless period, the groundwater may sustain the river water flow. So groundwater and river water, other surface water, connects together. Okay? And also, as I mentioned, the water flows. So we needed to know to describe the groundwater and surface water flow system and cycle system correctly, we have to know where does groundwater come from? Which pathway does groundwater flow through? And how long does it take? So the location and pathways and age, we needed to know for the groundwater and surface water cycle system. Water cycles, as I mentioned, so there are four photographs showing hydrological cycle features. Water evaporate in the ground in the midwinter season in Japan, and sometimes the very thunderstorms are coming in Mongolia. And also, even in very dry area in Mongolia, we can have the dug wells for looking at the groundwaters. And this is a typical photograph a stream in a tropical forest in Malaysia, nearby Kuala Lumpur. So those waters, cycles, and connect together. Again, I have to say the groundwater connects the surface waters together. OK, for us, to groundwater descriptions, movement descriptions, we needed to know three important components, as I mentioned in two later last slides. One is source. In other words, where does the water come from? And the other is, where does water come through? Path. And how long does it take times? So integrating three source, path, and times, we could say this info, this information is like a water CV. We need to understand or know water CV information to describe the groundwater flow system with surface water flow system, or including connection between the groundwater and surface water together based on the water CV informations. However, we cannot specify the difference of the waters. For example, if we have two glasses of waters, we cannot specify which is waters, the what difference of the waters. We cannot understand this water, where does that water coming from? What, where does this big grass of the water coming from? However, if we look at those water with chemical viewpoints, for example, there are two types of the water molecule in the waters, black one and white one. If we have chemical view, then a glass water may have the black molecule five. Right? But B, grass of the waters, include six black molecules. Then we can say grass A and grass B waters are much different from the viewpoint of the water molecule. That is basic concepts of the tracing of water cycles, looking at or using the chemical components. Usually, there are many chemical components, like a gas, chlorofluorocarbons and also radioactive nuclei and stable isotopes and also the chemical solutions behave with the water cycles. Water with the water cycles, many components, chemical components like a gas, solutions and the isotopes behave or flows with, with water cycle. Therefore, we could trace water behavior using those chemical components. And also, when we go to the field, we measure the water flow and water level of the groundwaters. And so to take the samples, for example, the spring water, then bring back to the laboratory to measure the chemical components. Then we could specify water CV information, age, source, and pass using the chemical components. And if we have final mixture of the waters, and there are three candidates of the water source, 
like, uh, for example, rain and with above waters and groundwater in headwaters. And we have just mixture. So we could specify or evaluate contribution ratio from each candidate of the mixtures or water source to the final destination, final mixture output of the waters using very simple mixing diagram or mixing equations. We call this scheme N member mixing analysis, EMMA. So we could use this very simple mixture scheme, then we could specify the contribution of each candidate of the water source to the final output of the water, final mixture of the waters. So I would like to show some case studies uh, using the tracing tracers to specify the water CV information and how we use those water CV information to the water management, groundwater management or groundwater governance schemes. First, I would like to show some case in Tunisia. We have some experiences to have investigation in Tunisia to construct a water CV. This is a key to review the water cycle system. And the Tunisia facing with a Mediterranean Sea and North area, we have uh, 500 millimeter a year per year in annual precipitation and bed in Southern area, just less than 100 millimeter per year for annual precipitation. We collaborate with our students, then we could need some uh, data for tracing to achieve water CV information. So in Tunisia North area, inland area and coastal area, we observed and we performed the groundwater and surface water sampling campaign in multiple timings in 2012 and 2013 to have physical chemical data in situ and also basic in solutions data and stable isotopes data. So looking at, focusing on the inland watershed, namely Siriana, I would like to explain how we reached at the water cycle system or concept based on the data. This diagram shows altitude versus runoff in the left and stable isotopic composition of oxygen 18 and sodium concentration ratio to the total cations versus altitude again. Okay, so in June and December, rainy season and dry seasons. So looking at the diagrams, the dark blue color denotes the groundwater recharge dominant area, and light blue area shows an area with groundwater discharge dominant area, groundwater discharge to the river water. And groundwater recharge dominant means that river water may recharge the groundwaters. For example, here, the runoff, decreases very drastically, then meaning, the meaning that groundwater should be recharged by the river waters. And also here, the groundwater and surface water, the chemical composition almost the same as well. Here, then here, the ground river water runoff increased very much and the stable isotopic composition and sodium concentrations increased with that. Therefore, these area, groundwater should discharge to the river water. Therefore, the runoff increased and stable isotopic composition and concentration sodium is increased as well. So based on that information, also we could specify the final groundwater output how much contribution from each candidates of the water source. One is one candidate of the water source is maintenance headwater groundwaters here and reservoir water, dam waters, and upstream groundwaters here. So those three are candidates of the important water source for the final downstream region groundwaters here. So using chloride 
concentrations and deuterium H2 isotopic composition, then we could evaluate the contribution ratio to the final groundwater from or by each candidate of the water source. So one is 30, because most uh, each can each each candidate of the water source contribute 30% to the final groundwater. So note, please, even the Syrian dam water contributes much 30% to the total uh, the groundwater, final groundwater in the downstream here. So this is a schematic diagram based on that chemical and physical data evaluations regarding the water cycle system of the groundwater and surface waters. So in the mid area, there is a big dam. So dam water may recharge the groundwater. And finally, in the downstream region, the groundwater composed, consists from the very uh, high mountains groundwaters traveling a long time and or very short time period groundwater flow system that is also contributing to the final groundwater in the downstream region. So multiple groundwater flow system should contribute to the lowland groundwater uh, flow system. And also, therefore, we have to understand the groundwater recharge is consists of uh, very importantly from the reservoir water. In other words, reservoir water, surface water may be very important role in the groundwater recharge. Therefore, in also the same Tunisia area, we, we also uh, made clarified the role of the surface water into the groundwater recharge using some very uh, typical two watershed in the vicinity or, or facing together, a north watershed has dam inside of the watershed, but the south watershed doesn't have the dam. Okay, dam watershed, Lebna watershed, and Shiva watershed without dam. So we could compare those two dams. Okay, now those line is a contour line of the groundwater level meaning the groundwater flow system based on the control line. So in the north watershed, groundwater flows from the inland to the coast, right? On the other hand, southern watershed, non-dam water, non watershed, groundwater flows from the coast to the inland because the inland groundwater level lower. However, dam watershed may have higher groundwater level in the inland. Therefore, groundwater flows from inland to the coast. So the northern dam watershed, groundwater level fluctuate through the three years. However, not so, not so serious groundwater level drawdown. However, in the south watershed, non-dam watershed, groundwater sometimes draw down very drastically due to uh, irrigation or dry seasons. So little seasonal change and first recovery of groundwater level in dam watershed. However, the large seasonal change, slow recovery of the groundwater level is a very characteristic, characterized in the non-dam watershed. So finally, I would like to show the chemical components of dam watershed and non-dam watershed. Dam watershed for the groundwater, except for the stream flow, the groundwater chloride conditions, the circle area shows the relative concentration magnitude of the chloride, chloride concentrations. So the groundwater shows lower or depleted chloride concentration in dam watershed, except for the surface stream. However, non dam watershed, the groundwater may have higher concentration of chloride. So using the chloride concentration and oxygenating isotopic compositions, the groundwater in the dam watershed and non dam watershed, the yellow dam watershed show the uh, light orange, shows the scattering here, surrounded by 
the end members, candidate of the source of the waters, fresh surface waters coming from the reservoir and rain waters here, and saline brackish waters. So we use this diagram then coming to uh, contribution ratio specification, evaluation from fresh surface water from the reservoir, rain waters in purple, and saline brackish water in blue. So in dam water, the much of the water is coming from the surface water in the dam. However, the non-dam waters, the much of the water is coming from the brackish water, saline water showing in blue. So schematic diagrams clearly shows dam watershed, the reservoir water may infiltrate in the ground and inland here, the groundwater level sustain at higher level due to the infiltration from the dam, then this higher groundwater levels regulate brackish water intrusion. Therefore, the brackish water cannot intrude into the inland. On the other hand, non-dam watershed, the groundwater table or level in the inland is very low as compared with the sea level. Therefore, the groundwater flows from the coast to the inland and brackish water may intrude into the inland. Therefore, I would say the dam waters could be used for effective, the regulation of the saline water, brackish water intrusion. That's an alternative water use for the, or, or alternative use for the reservoir or dam in the semi-arid regions. I would like to introduce a little bit about groundwater system research in Clown River watershed in Malaysia, collaborating with some of my good friends in from MJIAT, Dr. Pfizer and Dr. Professor Gotto, and Dr. Roslan from UKM, uh, Dr. Ayu from UPM, and Dr. Kamarudin from Malaysia Nuclear Agency. And many of the work is performed by my excellent student, Mariko Saitos and perform a uh, and, uh, water sampling campaign in the Clown River watershed nearby Kuala Lumpur. This is a topographical diagram map uh, of the Clown River watershed and uh, the, the geological map here, and also land surface conditions there. So more than, more than 50 water samples we took uh, with our collaborators, good friends, then leading to leading to a spatial distribution of oxygenating stable isotopic compositions uh, showing color, the red and orange showing the higher uh, stable isotopic composition and blue and light blue shows a lower one. And this diagram shows the oxygenating uh, isotopic ratio versus elevation for groundwater square and river water uh, circle and the dire rainwaters. And dotted line shows the mainstream directions from higher headwaters and lower. So higher, the stream water stable isotopic composition increased with decreasing with elevation. However, lower than 40 meters elevations the stream flow oxygenating values increased, or oh, sorry, decreased with increasing, decrease with a decrease of elevation. That's opposite trend. And lowland area stable isotopic composition in the groundwater is lower. And those depleted isotope composition corresponding to the higher elevation values. Therefore, this might show or suggest Mostly, the rainwater is a source fallen onto above the elevation, approximately 70 meters is a source, important source for the groundwater recharge in lowland areas. This is a cross sections, A, B cross sections here, and C, Ds there, and B, F there, E, F there, with chemical compositions with basic components of solutions and colored show oxygenating areas. So the surface water readily shows a higher composition of oxygenating 
and chemical composition like the, the specificate or characterized by the high sodium and high sulfate. And groundwater is here stable isotopic composition lower corresponding to the higher elevation areas, uh, watershed, uh, river waters corresponding. And those waters, calcium and bicarbonate dominant characterizations corresponding to that of some groundwaters in lowland area. So again, the groundwaters or river waters or groundwaters in lowland areas is sourced from the river water or rain waters higher than the elevation of 70 meters. So if we need to sustain the groundwater in lowland area, we have to conserve the area more than elevation of 70 meter in the Klang River watershed. We understand very well about mostly 90% of the water source in Kuala Lumpur region is coming from the surface water, river water, and reservoir waters. However, from the viewpoint of the quality, the river water is not perfect. Therefore, the groundwater is an alternative water source for the important uh, drinking water source. Therefore, we would like to perform this kind of groundwater flow system research more in near future with uh, very great uh, collaborations friends. And finally, I would like to show the in the relationship between the good case of the groundwater governance based on well understanding of the groundwater flow system performing with our students and uh, colleagues in Ono City, Fukui prefectures, uh, central west side of the Japan archipelago. This is Japanese archipelago and Fukui, look at here, and Ono City is look at there. And this is the watershed in total, Kuzuri River watershed. Four main watershed, river watershed included in total Kuzuri watershed in here. With a distance here, 20 kilometers for the scale. And we performed the water sampling campaign for the surface water showing red and groundwater showing black. For the groundwater, we performed more than 200 groundwater samples we took in 2013 and 2014. And this diagram shows a special distribution of oxygenating and stable isotopic composition in groundwater and river surface waters here. And color show the relative values of isotopic compositions, blue, depleted, lower, and red and orange, higher. And circle shows the isotopic composition of the river water. And color gradient shows uh, relative values of the ground waters. Looking at here, the left-hand side, left bank side of the Mana River areas, that is the blue color shown here. The basically rain waters in this area characterized by higher stable isotopic composition. Therefore, if only rain water is source of the waters, groundwater and surface water, then every water, every area colored by the red and orange. However, in, especially in these areas, the light blue is characterization of the ground waters. That is very clearly shows recharge from the river water into the ground waters. Looking at groundwater level quantum map here, January, August, and March, this line shows the quantum line, equi groundwater level line. Therefore, groundwater flows with the uh, groundwater flows perpendicular across the groundwater level contour line from the higher points to the lower points, especially looking at or focusing on the left bank side of the, this river, then clearly the groundwater flows, flows from east to the west, east to the west. This shows clearly the river water may affect on the groundwater. River water recharge the groundwater very significantly. 
Based on these scientific outputs, the local government in summertime, they perform the fresh discharge uh, coming from the dam upper stream, then that very big amount of the river water may easily recharge the groundwater on the left bank side. Additionally, they performed artificial recharge using paddy field during the winter. During the winter, we cannot use the paddy field, except for that the local government make the surface water on the non-used paddy field, showing here. So coming from the waters from the river to the paddy field, then during the winter season, they pond the water on the paddy field. That ponded water infiltrate into the ground. So that is very easy or very effective artificial recharge using unused paddy field during the winter seasons. Based on the scientific findings, that is, the that shows clearly the importance of the surface water into the groundwater recharge. This diagram is a history of scientific research and groundwater governance relationship in Ono City. The horizontal axis shows a time or age, and the vertical axis shows the direction of from the research policy and action users or stakeholders. In 1970s, 1980s, the hydrogeological investigation or groundwater level monitoring performed as a basic test of the hydrological cycle investigations. Then leading to a distribution of pipeline and recycling of the water promoted by the local government and coming to uh, citizens, and citizens very, very, uh, very good efforts to minimize the water use or recycling of the water use. 1990s and 2000, the local government asked to the comp consult consultation company to perform continuously groundwater level analysis and also numerical simulation, leading to the importance, awareness of the importance of the river water or surface water into the recharge for the groundwaters. So they started irrigations, the artificial irrigation using the paddy fields here. And finally, very recently, they asked us to perform the chemical tracing uh, test to evaluate the role of the river water into the groundwater recharge. Therefore, they promote more regarding the groundwater recharge governance, because the groundwater is very valuable water source in Ono. Quality is very nice. And uh, actually, the Ono city is using the groundwater for drinking waters. Therefore, they use the scientific findings of very good water governance. And also, low tech is very important for groundwater governance. Every morning, local local people, local person, this gentleman monitor the groundwater level and show that recorded values of the groundwater depth, level depth to the to the to the signals or right here. And also the children, so local people perform the cleaning the groundwater or spring water area to sustain the spring water and groundwaters very clean situations because they have suffered from dry up spring water in 1975 due to uh, uh, too much groundwater pumping up. Therefore, based on their uh, experience, they promote groundwater governance very actively based on findings of the science researches. And every stakeholder from citizen and also companies and local government as well, they work together, collaborate together, then do efforts to sustain the groundwaters very well. So I would like to summarize my talk today. The water CV as the so, uh, consists consisting of source, path, and times is a very key to understand the groundwater flow system and co to construct the governance schemes, well governance schemes. And surface water is very important for the groundwater recharge and regulation of brackish water intrusion in especially semi-arid regions. 
and also area with a forest and, and then the elevation more than 70 meters is very important as research zone of groundwater in Kuala Lumpur. It's very small findings still now, but we would like to continue to, to perform this kind of research, advanced research for the groundwater flow system in Kuala Lumpur. And also scientific findings of groundwater flow system should be applied to the political action for better groundwater governance. And low tech should be integrated with advanced technique to observe the groundwater flow system uh, for the groundwater governance. And multiple isotope approach would be better applied more for groundwater flow system research in Malaysia. We just start with a very good collaborators and friends regarding the, this kind of multi-isotope approach for the groundwater and surface water interaction uh, research. So we would like to promote more with very good friends in Malaysia. And I, we, we will do our best to contribute to the education and research uh, in Malaysia as well with our very good, uh, very good friends. Thank you very much for your attention. Yeah, so it's very uh, fruitful uh, sharing from uh, Professor Sujimura. Thank you very much. We have some Thank question here. Uh, perhaps uh, one, one of the question is, uh, can we consider the unsaturated thicknesses of the important issue of the hydrogenical quantities in managing the groundwater? And uh, how can we indicate uh, it practically? Mm. Thank so you very much for question. very, yeah, thank you very much. Uh, it's a very important and very interesting viewpoint or questions. Unsaturated zone locates or exists between the ground surface and groundwater table. So if it is thick, if it is thick, we need to consider more about unsaturated water movement. We call it soil water dynamics movement before the groundwater recharge. Okay, so that, uh, very interesting for me, very interesting for me, in the area of the Kuala Lumpur, from the chemical viewpoint, the surface water chemistry is much different from uh, the groundwaters, that of the groundwaters. So non, at the present stage, we understand non-direct interactions between the surface waters and groundwater in Kuala Lumpur area promoted. I guess more importantly, the groundwater flow itself from the recharge area, higher elevation to the lower areas. But actually, unsaturated water movement is very slow, much slower than the groundwater flow system because the unsaturated zone, the, uh, the pores of the soil include air and water, therefore, the water movement flux or velocity relatively lower, if it's slower as compared with that groundwater. Therefore, if the soil water contaminated once, that may cause very long time scale and serious issues. Therefore, in parallel with the groundwater flow system, we need to consider or investigate unsaturated zone water dynamics. Uh, continuously from the ground surface, unsaturated zone, then groundwater level, especially in the recharge area. Thank you very much for your good questions. Okay, I think uh, we have more questions. Uh, is yeah. that okay? Uh, from yeah, yeah, sure. Very interesting and many many of our audience, they would like to, to ask a question. I think one of it is that, I think this is from uh, the Sri Zaini Ujang, he's asking on the <laughs> top of uh, them and uh, Fetty Field, what are other possible methods to commonly uh, conduct uh, the uh, artificial recharge in Japan? And uh, is it also applicable in Klang Valley, Malaysia? Okay, that's a very, very difficult question. Actually, <laughs> that the, <laughs> uh, well, uh, yeah, and the, yeah, uh, it could be, but um, importantly, during the winter season in Japan, we have the four seasons, and during the winter seasons, the farmers, don't use the paddy field. Therefore, we could use that paddy field, unused period, the paddy fields uh, for the artificial recharge mechanism. However, maybe in Malaysia, 
the throughout the year they can use the paddy field they can they can feed the uh, rice therefore there are not unused time period for the paddy field therefore i'm not sure i cannot have confidence to 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 have agreement with local farmers in clan river watershed because they would like to use the paddy field throughout the years and they would like to get more money therefore um we physically or technically we could use that reservoir waters and also the paddy field waters but uh the consensus is the much more important issues i guess thank you very much for your good questions <laughs> okay so i think that's quite interesting and uh, the other question is uh, this is from uh, winterlin what uh, could be the possible prolonged impact if we opt for groundwater in the future uh, because the I water will be, will be finished and you need to replace the waters uh, because uh, the recharging period needs, needs to be uh, you know in 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 the, in the process by nature so how actually can be done in a way okay but very interesting and very good question again and thank you very much and <clears throat> um yeah um groundwater actually the role of the groundwater is becoming becoming more important especially in the recent recent era under the climate change conditions because that the uh, in the general perspective under the climate change conditions uh, the the the, the uh, extreme phenomena may occur very frequently so especially for the surface water river waters sometimes more flood uh, for japan as well therefore such kind of uh, the very uh, the surface water with very high amount of discharge during the flood could not be available for the for the for the users therefore apparently under the climate conditions apparently we could have more rainfall however we cannot use every water under the uh, extreme phenomena phenomena therefore the importance of the groundwater is uh, become more become much more however importantly we need to know the groundwater is recharged by the rainwater basically for the especially for the shallow waters so we need we must know how much recharge rate per year for the groundwater is there at least at least we cannot use the groundwater more than recharge rate if we use the groundwater in the quantity more than recharge rate then the groundwater may disappear in near future therefore at first we needed to know the source of the groundwater and how much recharge rate of the groundwater and how much we now use or pumping up the groundwater such kind of water budget with time and space heterogeneity then we could we could we could construct the very sustainable planning for the groundwater governance is it is it answer for the questions well it's very interesting because the uh, water rationing also is very important if we truly just want to use our ground waters uh, for the uh, main source of a uh, uh, plantation and and things like that All right. and uh, the other question is uh, i think this is from uh, Iwamoto sensei, yeah, uh, it says a, a law of groundwater <laughs> seems happy for us. Uh, on the other hand, are there any disadvantage of too many groundwaters? Uh, well, actually, um, partly yes. Thank you, thank you very much, Iwamoto sensei. And the um, yeah, which is better that if the groundwater level is too low, means yes is too low it is very hard for us to get the groundwater using the wells uh, but it is if the groundwater level is too high uh, those areas becomes wetland so in that case we could the wetland basically corresponding to the groundwater discharge area that is the output area out outflow area of the groundwaters therefore in that area, we could more frequently the groundwaters as compared with other regions. Therefore, 
we need to know not only for the vertical scale of the groundwater level is low or high, but we need to know the flow system of the groundwaters. So if the groundwater level is very high at the groundwater discharge area, that would be not so serious. It's very fruitful or useful for the people, local, especially local people. So, but in the rural area, uh, urban area, if the groundwater level is too high, under constructions may be attacked somewhat uh, by the groundwater. Actually, uh, some of you may ever been to Japan and been to Ueno station of railway, very one of the biggest station in Tokyo city. And in the Ueno stations, the bottom of the under construction was uh, 30 meter below the ground surface. However, the groundwater level uh, 12 meters, meaning more than 15 meters of the under constructions filled by or attacked by the water pressure of the groundwaters. That sometimes may cause very serious issues for the constructions. So in that case, we would better use appropriately the groundwater more. But and, it's not easy. Yeah, quite, quite interesting answers for that. But uh, do we need to have a proper regulation for the groundwater in case of, you know, many people are actually uh, developing of, you know, uh, grounding the, 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 the soil to get a water. So in that case, do you think that it's very important to have a proper regulation on this? Yes. And um, the groundwater regulation is not easy for us, but at least we need to monitor what well known about the fluctuation of the groundwater level uh, at the wells uh, in, in, in multiple levels. Without those, we cannot, we cannot do any more regulations at all. So yeah, your your important point is very welcome to me. Yeah, uh, very interesting. But I think uh, we have a uh, one question on it left. Yeah, but uh, before I think answers, uh, Professor Iwamoto Sensei, a question from uh, Dr. Suzanne Ujang: How to treat groundwater pollution from lechete or nutrients? Well, basically, it's very important, and uh, again, muzukashi. It's very difficult for me to answer that. Basically, at first, in the beginning, we shut down the contaminant source. We needed to know the contaminant source point. That is first. However, usually, the replacement time or the groundwater age tends to have more than a few years, sometimes 10 years, 20 years. It means if we shut down the contaminant source, then the effect of contamination would continue at least 10 years, 20 years. So at first, how to treat groundwater pollution? Of course, the shutdown, the groundwater uh, contaminant source. After that, we needed to, we needed to uh, make a purification treatment, not only in the vicinity of the source of the contaminant, but also along with the groundwater flow pathway. Otherwise, Otherwise, we cannot stop at all uh, the groundwater contamination effect. Is it? <laughs> well, it's very uh, yeah, good uh, suggestion on that, and uh, very important also to protect our groundwater from the pollution. Yeah, and right. I think this is the last question. Yeah, from Iwamoto Sensei. Yeah, Professor Iwamoto, is it possible to predict the groundwater flow from the geological data and condition? Well. Um, it, um, basically, that uh, under the steady state conditions, we could predict the groundwater flow based on the geological data and input uh, conditions, and the and also the, the the boundary conditions. However, unsteady state conditions, it's very hard for us to predict that because uh, there are many issues in which we haven't yet understood. For example, under the climate change conditions, the frequency of the huge amount of the rainfall event would increase. Under that conditions, the groundwater recharge rate would be the same or not. Nobody answered that at the present stage. So we needed to uh, research on the 
effect of climate change on the groundwater recharge. That would be one of the most important topics for the field of the groundwaters in which we have to tackle with. Okay. I think uh, time is very limited for us, but I think it's very interesting uh, discussion from you. I have also many questions to ask, but I think very <laughs> unfortunate because the right. time constraint, perhaps uh, we are going to have uh, Professor Jimura in the future to share with us again on the topic related to these ground waters and very important for us to protect our environment, especially in relation to our uh, call this, uh, sustainable development goals. And a part of it is, I think every everyone is aware that water is very important for us in becoming scarce because of the pollution, because of uh, the, the increasing numbers of you know population and things like that. I think uh, thank you very much again, Prof. Sujimaras, for your time. And uh, thank you very much. to Prof. Dr. Rafik, please, any final remarks you want to share? Thank you. Thank you, Prof. Ali, for sharing the session and for introducing Professor Maki Sujimura to me. And to our distinguished speaker today, Professor Maki Sujimura, thank you so very much for sharing uh, such a valuable information to all of us. And to all of you watching this uh, UTM Engineering Distinguished Lecture Series, thank you for watching. Uh, do stay tuned because we have many more lectures for you. Until then, bye-bye for now. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. <laughs> okay. See you again. Bye -bye. See you again. Bye-bye. See you. Bye-bye.